My name is Ron Stout, and uh, I, I've been looking forward to this day for years. Um, we have together today uh, just a spectacular group of speakers who are um, gathered because they're participating in, or have participated in, two significant um, activities. Um, we have three hours of presentation and discussion. All of every every three hour every hour session is set up to give you like five, four, three, four, five. Um, very short, six-minute kind of like thought starters from people who have spent a lot of time and energy thinking about the topic, and then to engage you. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, if you're not going to engage with us, we'll engage with each other, because we have dinner, we do stuff, we like each other, we have a lot to say. Um, so if you don't want to talk to us, we'll talk to each other, and that will be good too. That will be interesting too. Um, my, um, my part of this um, is, I sort of flip over on both, but my part of it that I'm, I'm, I'm standing up here today for is that I am one of the co-editors of the um, Chicago Kent Law School um, Law Review Symposium called Justice, Lawyering, and Legal Education in the Digital Age. And we think this is the answer to many of the questions raised on um, Thursday morning and especially yesterday morning by Bill Henderson. And um, there's a copy of the book here for all of you if you wish to pick up one. Um, John tells me people don't like that. Which is odd, because you know when you started this conference, this conference thing, you used to give everybody all kinds of books because you're a voracious reader. Um, and even I think uh, even Stanley Fish is saying, throw away all your books and just look at stuff on digital format. Um, Do we have a Kindle version of that? So we have we have we have seven article authors represented in our array of presentations this morning in this track, and um, and in addition we have um, a group of. Faculty members, some of who, some of whom overlap the author group, who John's going to tell you about. Good morning. Good morning. My name is John Mayer. I'm the executive director of Cali, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction, and I'm a setup guy, right? So I do a little bit of setup. So you just heard about the symposium. The reason for Cali's uh, involvement is that, is that we, we got a grant along with the Center for Access to Justice and Technology here at Chicago Penn. We should probably start using the acronym. So Cali got a grant from LSC, a TIG grant, uh, with CATJ to, uh, to do this, this A to J project. Um, and basically, basically the idea here is, is this. We've, written a piece of software called A to J Author, and I'll give you a little picture of that in a second. And there aren't enough authors in the world to automate all of the legal forms that need to be automated to even begin to, to, to deal with the, uh, the justice gap. Um, and the pool of authors that we want to grow is right in front of us. It's, it's, at, it's at the law schools and, in the, and taking clinic courses at the law schools that are members of Cali. So this project is to is to do a pilot with six schools on how they might integrate A to J author into their teaching and then inform us about features and functions and we're going to create a website from that that we will we'll then open up to all 200 schools and actually it goes beyond 200 because I've got emails and interest from the folks who were here from Trinidad and Tobago and from Hong Kong and from even further places like Canada who want to do the same sort of things. They want to integrate they want their students to learn how to automate uh, legal processes to help uh, their uh, help poor people, essentially. All right. So here are the uh, three. Here are the uh, three uh, sessions for this morning. I'm not going to read the screen. You can see it on your on your own thing. But the first one will basically be the uh, the, the hybrid courses. The second one oops, will be the traditional clinic courses. The third will be sort of the wider perspectives on that. And uh, this is what A to J author is. This is, I feel like I should give you like one minute on A to J author in case you've never looked at it or seen it yourself. Um, it's, a, it's a graphical user interface. It's, it's a, essentially a web-based form, but there's a lot of attention paid to making it easy to use for someone who is uh, maybe English as a second language, maybe hasn't finished high school, maybe is afraid of technology, and more than likely is in a stressful situation because they have a legal problem. And they can't get access to legal aid, they can't get a lawyer. Many people, 80%, up to 80%, stand in line when the door closes for legal aid at the end of the day, 
And so their only alternatives, many of them, their only alternatives will be going to the web to find a solution. And hopefully there's a form that's been automated that might help them in their situation. And the the author is, uh, is, is, a, is an attempt to solve some of those problems, All right? So this is what the authoring system looks like on the, uh, on the left. This is what it looks like to the user on the right at the top. And right now with A to J, you marry it with a document assembly <laughs> system so that after the person fills out the forms, I always have to compare it to TurboTax. How many people, how many people do their taxes by hand? <laughs> All right, so I'm using negative space there. So, the, so how many people use TurboTax, Tax Slayer, Tax Act? Yes, almost everybody. So A to J author is like a TurboTax for all the rest of the forms in the world, in which the authors are the experts, legal aid people, or in this case, they'll be students working with legal aid attorneys to, uh, to automate a particular process. Slide. A to J, we, the legal aid uh, organizations have taken this up. They've automated well over 900, or well over 800, the guided interviews, that were used a half a million times just last year, and a million and a half times in the last uh, four or five years. So that's huge. But it's not, it, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a small bite out of a, out of a very big elephant. And the goal is, next slide, the goal is to create <coughs> course materials from these people that will then be distributed to or made available for free for other law schools so that they could use them as a starting point to teach their own classes and their own students so that we don't have dozens of authors, we have hundreds or we have thousands, so we don't have 800 forms, we have 8,000 forms, we don't have a million usages, we have 100 million usages, you know, and, and maybe some bigger bites out of that elephant of the justice gap. Yeah, too much of a metaphor there, right? Next one. So the cool, yeah. <laughs> so what, I, what I love about this project is it's a, it's a, it's a quad factor win, right? <laughs> Students pay tuition to learn a 21st century skill, which is how to automate a law process. The schools get to offer, get a piece of software that's part of their Cali membership to do this. Legal aid gets help automating forms, and the public gets the automated forms for their help. And um, that's win, 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 win. All right, next slide. I'm going to hand it off to Ron. All right, so um, one of the things in Bill Henderson's Blueprint for Change. Hey, Bill. Good to see you. Long time. Um, the Blueprint for Change is, is about collaboration. It's about collectives. It's about getting together and making stuff happen. And that's really what today is all about. It's like bringing back to you some of the results of those collectives. And, and one of the most important people in the, in the symposium side of this collective is Mark Lauritsen who is our co-author, uh, editor, and, and an author. And, and Mark just flew in from Rome, from the AI and Law Conference, to be here with us today. And he will moderate uh, the next session, and uh, the last session talking about his, his uh, article, which, which is uh, an, an, an interesting perspective on the First Amendment and uh, other important issues that we're facing. Um, I also have with me uh, some people that collaborate with me, Andrew Medeiros, who helped me write uh, the article, helped edit this, the symposium, and, and Jessica Frank, who is the director of our center here. So nothing happens without all these people. Thank you. All right, so to about to launch into um, into sort of uh, ignite Ted sort of fire starter kind of uh, presentations after this introduction. So thank you, John, for getting this started. Um, the first of these sort of hybrid courses that, that was developed was developed here. It was called the Justice and Technology Practicum course. We started teaching it in, in 2010. So we'll be teaching it for the fourth time this coming fall. Um, and um, it's, it, it is a, a true hybrid. Um, I used to be a clinical teacher um, 30 years ago, but I teach in the classroom now. I teach um, uh, copyright law and public interest law um, and in a very 
pretty traditional way, although there are projects and things going on in some of those courses. Um, but um, I teach this course with a, a piece of that traditional style, uh, the piece being a series of readings and presentations and guest speakers, some of whom you're going to hear from today, um, who are either appear in person or by Skype. And we raise and think about the issues that, that John has made us think about a little bit that are justice related, but also about issues related to the core function, the core competencies that students need to develop in order to be effective practitioners in this emerging digital world. Um, so we look at traditional readings, we have class discussions in much the way you would have class discussions in any traditional classroom course. Um, in that context, we also assign projects to students that are um, require legal research. For example, pick, pick a simple one. We, somebody wants to do a uh, uh, automate the fee waiver uh, 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 petition in a, in a local court. Well, they've got to go read the statute and analyze any case law about what makes somebody um, eligible for that process. But they also need to understand the procedure and more. Interestingly, I think from a sort of a quasi-clinical perspective, we push them into the environment, make them follow people around the courthouse as they try to get their fees waived on their own. Make them go to the court session where the judge decides whether or not that fee waiver is granted and gather up from legal experts like Sunrise and others who are in the room, um, Joe and, 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 and Conrad, people who are deep into practicing law, understand the heuristics of that process. And so they get a deep look at a particular process. In addition, they have to do a memorandum about that, a traditional legal writing exercise, a, a memorandum that will document that background of law, procedure, and heuristics to sort of audit the results that they're going to produce. Next, they do some field work. In addition to that following around, they sit in help desk settings where these kinds of tools that they're going to build are used by low-income people and watch them do that that effort. Watch them try to work through on their own um, a, um, a, a guided interview or help them work as a navigator work through a guided interview to understand the customer. You get a sense of the, the uh, linguistic levels and the kinds of language that they understand and, and the problems that they have using the tool in order to how to deal with those problems. Um, and then they dive into the technology. They write a hot docs template, which is the document assembly back end that produces the documents and an A to J guided interview. We teach them this A to J product in two, four, two, 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 two hour sessions, four hours. Jessica does most of that work. Um, and we find students are able to pick it up and do things pretty quickly. Then. All right, so that's a little bit about the justice problem and a little bit about the educational perspective. Next slide. <clears throat> Well, we can, we can talk about this. So, so these are the, 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 um, the tasks in the course that we developed. We do this field observation, 20 hours is required. They do a scope document to help begin to understand how project planning works, a research memo, a storyboard, and then the, the technology is delivered. And, and out of this course, we've delivered maybe 30 um, guided interviews and document templates that have been used by um, Legal Aid in Illinois and North Carolina and Minnesota on the Nez Perce Indian Reservation in Montana, in North Carolina, um, in Ohio. Uh, so, so we've had connections with a lot of different legal aid organizations um, in, in a variety of different subject matters in that slide. All right, so this is about education. We're at a law school and we have to figure out why education matters. And to many, many um, um, sort of viewpoints, that's what this book is about. That's what this uh, symposium issue is about. How do we validate that this belongs in a law school and it begins to make people ready with the practices that are going to face. So we're going to hear from different perspectives from folks who have tried different kinds of things in this space through this morning and early afternoon. But from my point of view, and what we Andrew and I suggest in the article is that we get this deep dive into law procedure and heuristics that you've already heard from me, that we get exposure to policy and ethical issues raised by legal services delivery and technology, and there are unauthorized practice issues that we face, and you can hear it's sort of a, a very interesting perspective on that from Mark Lawrenson at the end of the, of the, of the session today. Um, and, but, but there are others, uh, issues about confidentiality, about practicing in the cloud, and so on and so forth. Um, we think there are key competencies for the emerging law practice coming here, e-lawyering, unbundling, web to a cloud practice. And then um, the, the, the area that we found um, that sort of grew in depth as we wrote the article 
was that, uh, as, as we study what we did and what students said to us in their final reports, is that they're learning teamwork. They're learning how to see the world through the eyes of somebody else. Empathy. The eyes of a, of a client that didn't have the same educational background that they had. They're learning project management, how to have a beginning, a middle, and an end to a project and to deliver it on time and to report to their, to their client and make things happen in a way that is professional and, and thorough and detailed. Um, and perhaps that's the best thing that comes out of this. All right, next person. Um, we introduce Judith White. Yes, sir. And Judith, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't do justice. We're so delighted that you're here. Thank you. <laughs> so so, so tell, tell us about yourself and your project. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Is this on? Is that on? Can you hear me? Okay. Hey, is that on? Good. Uh, I'm from University of North Carolina. I'm delighted to be part of this project. Uh, Give it a moment. Got it? Okay. So I started uh, to develop a course with a colleague at University of Cincinnati, Lou Billion is the dean there, several years ago. We had uh, both been on the faculty at UNC before we left for Cincinnati to become dean, and I had done work uh, previously at uh, the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, uh, working on their <laughs> Educated Lawyers Project. So I've been thinking for a very long time about the questions displayed there. It's kind of my quest that's an effort to bring you down to the um, How do students learn? What do they learn? What don't they learn? Part of what the Carnegie study really highlighted is ways in which traditional teaching methodologies leaves gaps in what they learn particularly focused on the question of transition between being a student to being a person who sees themselves as a, a professional a practitioner. Often students are thinking about being students while they're within the schoolhouse doors, but it takes a mental leap to begin to see yourself actually operating within the profession. And we, I think, need to give more support as people make that transition. Uh, how do you address these things within the curriculum? I think we've had a growing number of efforts that are extracurricular uh, professionalism programs, counseling by career services, but we haven't really brought it within the heart of what we do next slide, please. So really can think about models of legal education. The one on your uh, left is traditional, thinking like a lawyer. If you want to know more about what I think on that, read an article at length that I wrote in Rutgers. Law review. We do a lot with what Carnegie would call the cognitive apprenticeship, thinking processes, taking people through systematic analysis and so forth. And we do a lot with law, different fields of law, what, what our specialties are in our courses. And we do a little bit, and I think more in clinical settings than others, but a little bit about what it means to be a lawyer. What this course, uh, Becoming a Professional, has tried to do working in part with the Center for Creative Leadership, a very thoughtful group based out of Greensboro, North Carolina, is to think about it from the other side of the bridge, of uh, what it is to be a professional. And I think you can see some parallels here. To be happy, to find that sweet spot in the middle of the Venn diagram, you need to have a context that really kind of ignites you. You need a set of skills that allows you to really work within that space. And you need some level of passion. You see, I think if you think about this, that will speak to you as some of the realities of uh, how we work. So the effort of this becoming a professional course is to use this model to get context, to uh, provide a broader set of skills and get some passion. Next, please. So uh, our first version of this course that has run now for a few years has looked deeply at the legal profession, had students really doing a study about different fields of practice that they might be interested in, has tried to introduce them to a variety of soft skills, different formats for speaking, teamwork across distance, connecting students based in Cincinnati with those in North Carolina, talking about issues of how you work with people of different backgrounds and so forth, but really focused very heavily on questions of values and identity. Hope the students up with practicing lawyers to probe some questions about what is it that really drives you and so forth. So we had collaboration built in because that certainly is something generally law schools haven't been doing enough of. And we assessed the students' work again, a hope for assessment that you'll hear more about from others. Reflection essays on a variety of things, uh, presentations, both as teams and in solo settings. Principal 
projects or pro bono, it's not a pro bono project that you would like to do when you're out in practice. Think about what it would take to do that. And I have to give credit, special credit to John Mayer, because back when I was on the Cali board and Barbara Lesnar Fines was chair of that board, John was uh, either coming or going from his sabbatical that really ignited his work around APJ. So I was trying within my modest circumstances to think about how I might simulate something like that. Next slide, if you will. Um, so what is it that we've done? Uh, as I said, I've covered most of these points on, on the left side, but cool projects that students did. Uh, one of the ones of the most recent crop was a student who is an immigrant to the States from Siberia, where his family had been because they were being uh, persecuted in Russia. He developed a program to deliver and a brochure to deliver to Russian emigres who spoke primarily Russian uh, about how they might want to rethink what the business forms were that they were using for things like construction businesses in order to make sure that they had appropriate protections for liability. Developing a website that would connect information about benefits for veterans, uh, military personnel, and various sorts. Uh, one who <coughs> piloted A2J for me, a student who has, uh, is the head of our Lambda group and has worked on facing, issues facing transgender people about how you get your driver's license and passport to have your new gender and your new name. Uh, and then uh, what I would describe as low bono, I think some of you know that term, less expensive, not for the poorest of the poor, but the people who need services, how you can set up a low profit effort to deal uh, with the needs of the people with security fraud. Next. So now with A2J, uh, some shifts here, new partners in the past, the design of courses had each of the two of us, Lou, Billy Owens in Cincinnati and me, and North Carolina having a, a practitioner or judge partner in teaching to really say we're talking about partnership and to make that real. This time it's going to be one of the folks from North Carolina Legal Services, it's a team of three that are working with us from there, one of whom will be sitting in a class each session. New options for projects, I met with them, they identify their top five priorities of things they would like to have addressed, recovery of personal property, security deposits, carbon care claims, uh, relief from collateral consequences of um, criminal charges that have been fund, and then de uh, seek and desist for debt collectors. So I'm hoping I'm going to get teams of students on each of those paths in lieu of the pro bono projects that I did previously. <coughs> I'm not going to require every student to do an A2J version, but instead will provide that as an option. And I think because it's sometimes hard for them to galvanize themselves and to crystallize their project, this will be a good approach. And they uh, tried the legal services people said that there would be real benefit to them as students could be uh, video giving a plain English explanation of the area of law in which they're working. Um, the opportunities and challenges, I think you can see there, uh, I think we'll get a lot out of it. Concrete options for the students to really take something from beginning to end in a very focused way. New skills we've been working on, but I think there's ways that this approach, this set of tasks, will really sharpen what they learn. I'm very interested in the assessment consequences of this to be able to show from the beginning to the end what they gain. Uh, also, hope that uh, I explore. We have a very active pro bono network in North Carolina, and I'd like to think if we can pilot this and possibly move it to some other schools, we might be able to really address the justice gap. I also hope this will be an opportunity. I have taught in our clinic the last five or six years. I'm not doing that this year because I'm doing this instead. I'd like to be part of the effort to get these possibilities out before faculty who aren't necessarily involved in clinic because I think there's a lot of ways that students can learn from this. I teach property. I'd like to have them be in the client role walking through some of the stuff we might create because I think that uh, that will really animate them to be better lawyers. Last slide. <laughs> Thank you, Sunrise. You wanted to step up or sit, whatever your pleasure. Greg, and this is Sunrise. We're using the mic not just for amplification, but also for uh, effective recording. And we got it. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sunrise Ayers. I'm going to be teaching Concordia's APA Clinic, which we're actually building from ground zero, we're gonna be um, creating this clinic around this project. So we're starting from scratch, which is exciting. Um, and 
And I'm Greg Sergi, I go on the academic dean. So Sunrise comes from a legal services perspective. She'll actually be teaching the course. And I think this is a great opportunity, but I've got a couple questions. First question, next slide. What are the challenges in delivering legal aid in Idaho? Thank you. Um, so I, I, I do come from a legal services background. I work at Idaho Legal Aid, which is the only um, free civil legal services provider in our entire state. And we only have the equivalent of 15 attorneys covering the entire state of Idaho. So not only do we have very limited um, civil, free civil, free civil legal aid um, attorneys available for our population, just in general, Idaho has the fifth lowest number of per capita attorneys. So we also have a, a low number of attorneys per capita that we're dealing with. And we're dealing with the fact that our um, citizens in Idaho are spread out across the state in rural areas where it can be difficult for them to contact an attorney at all, get to a, a, a meetings with attorneys, and especially if they have a um, sort of specialized legal need like Medicaid for long-term care, it can be really difficult for them to get to an attorney who specializes and has the knowledge in that area that they need. Um, so our vision, our vision for this project is that we have three outcomes that we're trying to sort of gear towards when we're um, building the clinic. And the structure of the clinic is that we're going to um, start with field work where the students will be out at our legal aid office, at our court assistance office. There's a homeless clinic that we um, hopefully can work with them as well. So they're um, going to start with that, then there's going to be some um, in-class um, delving into the substantive areas of law and elder law, and then the ATA forms. And so the three outcomes we're shooting for are knowledge, passion, and tangible products. Um, the first outcome is increasing knowledge, and um, specifically, we want to teach students how to effectively use A to J and hot docs in the legal practice, um, and how to fit those technologies into the practice of law so that I, if they're in public service work, obviously that fits, but even if they're in private work, how to fit that into maybe provide lower cost services. Um, how to do a legal needs assessment is going to be a part of our clinic. Um, how these, um, how to do the basics of a client interview and how to use cultural competency when you're doing client interviews. And then um, how to basically get that preliminary understanding of some of those areas of elder law that they'll need to figure out what forms they want to pursue. So Craig, how, does, how do these goals fit with Concordia's goals? Concordia's university is committed to public service. The university, which has a main campus in Portland, has won all sorts of awards for its public service. And not only for its own sake, but also because it aligns with the general missions of the university, we want to continue that. So we have extensive pro bono work, and this will fit very nicely into that. So we're very happy about the public service. But in addition, there's the educational outcome for us. It's not just a problem providing good legal services for poor people. I, when I was in practice, couldn't have afforded myself. Probably <laughs> most of us couldn't have afforded ourselves. And the middle class has problems too. Even general counsels at Fortune 500 companies are complaining about their legal bills. So, we see this as a chance for students to develop a key skill set, making legal practice more efficient with document automation. And once they get this, if they go spend a life doing legal services, that is wonderful. Even if they don't, this is stuff that they can use to help regular non-legal services lawyers deliver legal services to moderate income people, even wealthy people. We need to fix this problem as a legal profession, and I see this as a key part of that. And that brings me to my second question. We talked about the hard skills they'll get out. What, what is your other part of the vision for this course? Thanks, Greg. So the second part of our vision, next slide, is building student passion, um, which I was saying to that in the last presentation as well. Um, so in my experience as a new attorney at Idaho Legal Aid, um, I think a lot of us are coming from a place of relative privilege. And so I was thrown in the first day, I had to start taking clients the very first day I started, 
never having visited a homeless shelter, a domestic violence shelter, um, an Alzheimer's unit in a long-term care place. So um, I think that's the place where a lot of our students will be coming from as well. And so the most important part of building passion will be the field work. We'll, we'll be getting them out, meeting with low income and less privileged populations so that they are, um, so that they're getting to do these, they're gonna be doing these interviews and that they build during their needs assessment to find out what legal challenges these folks are facing every day. That in our, if, with no experience coming from, even uh, when I first started, I did not have that understanding of, and that's an understanding we want to build in the students. Um, the other thing that we'll be working on is with some of the readings and with the needs assessment process, giving the students an understanding of the systemic barriers that our low income folks are facing so that they um, have a sort of broader understanding of what's creating this gap, this justice gap that we're trying to fix. And then one of the classes we are going to talk about um, cultural competencies and also have a frank discussion if they have any concerns or any preconceived notions that they're coming in with what it will be like dealing with homeless populations or persons with disabilities to, to get that discussion going so that they feel completely comfortable the first time they have to walk into a homeless clinic. Or, yeah. Go okay, sorry. <laughs> um, and then the end result, of course, will be hopefully that once they finish the course, of course, they have a developed um, through this understanding and through the field work, a lifelong passion for public interest and hopefully pro bono work because Idaho has a really low pro bono participation rate right now. So Greg, um, one of your particular areas of expertise is improving and engaging student learning. So I'd like to um, have you speak more about that. Next slide, please. So the question is, how do you assess passion? And, and Barbara Glesner finds made a great point in a presentation yesterday. Grading is not assessment. If we ask students to display passion for a grade, huh. I'll make it. <laughs> so um, we're not going to make passion part of the grade. Um, I don't even think we're going to ask them about it. They tell us, great, but you know, we may do a survey after the course that will be anonymous and say, you know, how has this changed your attitudes? And that way, they don't have to tell Sunrise, you know, I still hate poor people. Um, that, that, that would be an outcome that we would want to know about, but uh, we can understand that a student would have a hard time delivering. So um, we, we'll, we'll do this anonymously. The other thing is um, assessing students. You know, we like to know their passion, but what we really want to see is how this course is making a difference, and we can wait for that. We are going to track our students and see how much they engage in pro bono activities. Do they take legal services jobs? And we're going to do this for all our students. So if we find out that our students who take this course do that more, that will be very helpful to us. It won't be dispositive. We may have a selection effect, but it'll let us know. So that's what we're going to do for figuring out how much of a difference this course is making. We've talked about the course. We've talked about students. We've left one bunch out, the clients. What are we actually doing for clients? Great, last, last slide. Oh, I'm gonna go fast. Um, <laughs> so our final goal, of course, is tangible products that are going to um, be dispersed and help our client communities. Um, we're gonna have the ATJ forums at the end of the clinic that will increase our Idaho citizens' access to justice. Um, the forms we're gonna be doing will be in the areas of elder law, likely involving Medicaid eligibility, advanced directives, wills, guardianship, whatever the students identify when they're doing their um, interviews and needs assessment. And so through this, we can then put those forms on Idaho Legal Aid's website, and people who could not have access to an attorney will have access to these forms, and we'll be able to track how many people use the forms through Idaho Legal Aid's website, and we have therefore helped the client community throughout Idaho. That's it, thanks. So as a lead in to Richard Granite, who is going to do something a little bit different, um, a little thank you to uh, Sunrise and her program, which is um, um, the partner, I know Legal Aid is the partner for Cali and Chicago Kent, uh, a whole series of these grants from the Legal Services Corporation. So thank you and Mary Zimmerman and all your colleagues for that. And, and, a, and a shout out, right? So Idaho, on a per capita basis, 
does more A to J guided interviews and hot docs templates for low income people than any other place in the world. <laughs> now, why did that happen? They had <laughs> an early partnership between the judiciary and Sunrise's program. A judge named Michael Denard got excited about this idea because of all the rural need in Idaho and this constraint 15 lawyers covering an enormous state the size of France. Um, and um, decided that this was a way to go. And Michael led this charge. He took it to the judges across the country, um, established a unit in the, in the judiciary that hired somebody to do this. And so then a great, a great service to the country and, and to the, this whole uh, area by, by partnering and leading in this way. So Richard, something completely different? Completely different. All right, completely different. Uh, Mr. Mike Richard. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's okay. I'll introduce you. Let me think. No, I didn't. No. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, one of the roles that I have is uh, to introduce us as co chair of what's known as the e learning task force of the ABA. The other co chair is Mark Lawrence and my colleague who's sitting right here. And we started this task force, which was presidentially appointed in 2000, 2000. It's about 13 years later. Started right here. Started in Chicago, Kent. I was involved in Kent Four. We actually did a uh, a working paper. One of the ten, one of the charges was to get law schools to teach law technology and practice management, and to get help lawyers figure out ways to deliver legal services online. For a long period of time, this was really a very quiet area, except for the last two or three years that we've had this recession and this upheaval, and everybody's looking at uh, really uh, online delivery of legal services as another way of getting access to justice, as we've been hearing. Uh, during the rest of the morning. So, um, in that context, Will Hornsby, who also is presenting a paper, came up with an idea that we should identify those law schools that are emphasizing, are making a commitment to teaching law students to be practice ready in technology and practice management, because that's what they're going to really need to be effective, particularly if they move into solo and general practice. So, we have compiled a list. All schools and many of the schools that are here. We have 13 schools now on the list. Uh, the list now appears on my blog, which is eLearning Redux, R E D U X. But it's moving to the eLearning page on the ABA website. Now, we're not endorsing these schools, as you know, Lana did. We're just kind of identifying schools that look interesting in making a commitment to technology and management. So, if you want to get on the list, I pay attention to the rest of the presentations. <laughs> and then write, if you think you belong on the list, write a note actually to John, and everybody who's here. John's so part of this group. And, and Ron. And then we're going to do some more criteria. And then we're going to publish it and blog about it as a way of really pressuring the environment to, to think more about why these are really key competencies that every lawyer needs to have. It's not our US needs to go report this. It's our own little thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, all right. So, with that said, uh, let's go to the next slide. You got two minutes, minutes left. No, you can do six. <laughs> what are you used for? I <laughs> don't <laughs> dance. Okay, so here we go. So, what do lawyers know? We know that law schools do a really good job of teaching, of teaching the law. But they do a very marginal job about the other things that we're going to be talking about today. And the personal story is I run a company. Well, first of all, I used to teach law practice management University of Maryland Law School to do applications of the law around 1999 as an adjunct. I think that the attention of the faculty actually had brought in about a half a million dollars worth of data so your faculty didn't pay attention to me so I quit. So I was a web company. <laughs> and then a couple of years ago, I started this other company, which provides a virtual law firm platform for law firms, which is actually a leading company. And I said direct law, it's called virtual learning made easy. It made simple. That was really a tough thing because it wasn't so simple, it turns out. And I talk to lawyers every day, and it's, it's a remarkable thing what they don't know. It's like a bell shaped curve. There's only 5% who really get it, 5% are irredeemable. And the people in the middle of the curve really don't know anything about what I'm talking about. <laughs> and therefore, they don't stay with our program. So we have this high churn rate. Uh, we pick it up, and, and you know, anyway, so I have to really educate the whole legal profession. And the stuff that I'm interested in and what they really need to be effective. I'm talking about solos and GPs now, people who are serving uh, with the broad middle class. So uh, <clears throat> the only way to do that is really to increase reach. Even though we kind of, Mark and I do outreach at law schools, 
comes with every formula we need is really not enough. So we really feel that we have to uh, develop the kind of stuff that's comparing a bad thing and a So the question is, what is loss rule for? What's it been for? We know that it's been for now, uh, training employees to work in large firms, become Supreme Court clerks, and clients custody. That's pretty much what the curriculum is, has been oriented to, except in the Senate. They pass the bar, that's right, I really want. And no job. What we find is that in a law school today, in the second, third, and fourth year law school, the folks that are going to come out are going to end up working in solo and general practice, but they're really not prepared to do that. So there's a real big disconnect. 80% of Americans still can't afford a lawyer. That's the one. Uh, and this is the kind of things that you heard yesterday, you'll hear again today, what law school is really about doing. You can read the article to get away from just about what that's read, right? Uh, but law school should be trained. Law school should be, because most of them are going to end up spending their lives in a solo GP practice, a small firm practice. It should really be practice ready. Uh, and begin to think about a whole set of issues. Public legal services, next slide. Uh, so that they can really penetrate what we call this latent market for legal services. The disconnect is huge. You can't have a legal profession that doesn't serve 85% of the U.S. public. If it doesn't serve that, we're going to have seismic change. At some point, <coughs> the system is going to crack. I'm talking about this regulatory system. We're going to have a different form of deregulation in the U.S. that essentially opens up the system. The, the, the pressure for deregulation in the U.K. came from the government because of consumer access. And unless the profession changes, Sometimes we're going to have that here as well. Meanwhile, we think that there are many markets here that can generate jobs for, for lawyers if they can figure out how to, how to, how to serve uh, clients. That's all. So I think that law school, not probably the other problem. I don't know, they could be a trade school, but, <laughs> but to think in terms of like a trade school, it's not all to think like a lawyer. How did you think like a lawyer? That's what law school should really be doing in my view. It should be like a restaurant, next slide. And when you learn how to run a restaurant, you think about all these things you have to know when you go to the culinary institute. They don't only teach you how to cook, they teach you all these other things that you really need to know how to run a restaurant, next slide. However, we know that law, being law is not like running a restaurant. Really, very different. And the paradigm that I like is what Columbia uses, which is there's a high information component to law. So if you don't know how to manage, organize, uh, generate, optimize the information component of law, it might be really not competent. Uh, law is being transformed by the internet. Law practice management courses that are taught in law school are obsolete. They're usually taught by um, a 65 year old practitioner. He's engaging in what this has had to say about 30 years back. It doesn't talk about virtual lawyering, but any of the things that we've been talking about today and, and, and tomorrow, next slide. So we think that law practice management and the application of law practice technology are, in fact, key competencies. We know, of course, you've heard that the ADA has now amended the definition of the competency of a lawyer, so that lawyers have to appreciate the risks and benefits of technology in terms of understanding what it means to be competent. So we've had that in the new standard, but it's not quite enough. These competencies have to be really ingrained. They almost should be, I hate to say it, required courses. Otherwise, the law students get out, they come up and work for anybody else, and do that for six or eight months. They just can't make it. They would can't make it. Prescription is bad. That's why. So I think the law practice management is newly taught as legal practice engineering, figuring out how to define a niche figuring out how to find a new kind of legal service. You know, when we have these areas, of these times of real depression and recession, these are times we pray too. You know, people can't get jobs. Experience people to become entrepreneurial. That's what we really need, new kinds of services that reach out to people in new and innovative ways. Next slide. Uh, my colleague who's not here has written the two books, Seth McKinbrough in this area, one on legal self-representation, one on virtual law practice. Next slide. And a new one she came out with on the consumer law re uh, revolution. They're all published by the law practice management section. I, I recommend reading them in terms of coming up to speed on these concepts. Next slide. So here's where we are. Uh, I think the profession is right here. 
That's really a problem. <laughs> every, other, every other service industry has a, has a client portal. When you sign on to your bank or your brokerage firm or your travel agency, you're signing on to a client portal. The number of uh, uh, law firms, solos and small firms that really even know what a client portal is, it's probably less than 1%. Uh, that's just an indication of the whole set of data that we have. It tells me that we're really, uh, this is, uh, we're really here. Next slide. And we need, we need to patch up. We need to catch up for the reasons that I, I, I argued before, that you can't have a profession that's only serving uh, you know, the top 10 to 15% either working working people, large corporations, or large organizations. It's got to serve everybody. It has to be 100% access. Next slide. And then we have the turkey metaphor. You probably heard about this one, right? Turkeys are really fat. And there are no turkeys in this room, by the way. These people are all leaders <coughs> in your space, in your law school. So the turkey gets fed and he's really happy, and he thinks he has a great life. And then about November 3rd, <laughs> so I think that we have lots of faculty, lots of lawyers who are turkeys. But okay, and, and, that, and lawsuits, you know, so they're going to end up. That's right. What happened to your time here? This is it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, know, you have to leave. You can't, you, one way is a dead end for the profession. You can't really follow. And I think that the people that I talk to, this is a great group. This is a, a catalytic group that can go out and provide leadership in your law schools and try and prevent them from wanting to interpret. John with failure. Um, you can't control these brilliant people. They all went over their six minutes, including us, right? So, um, but we do have, um, with, with all that effort, we preserve 10 minutes for discussion and questions and interaction with you. So, what do you have to say? They're all turkeys. <laughs> gobble, gobble, right? <laughs> Questions, thoughts, reactions? I told you we talk amongst ourselves if we don't. Do you believe this? I don't know if it looks a little familiar. Some of it is very inspiring. And when I say it looks a little familiar, it doesn't mean. But just because you've been to every Cali conference no, no, in the history of the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Familiar in of what in the sense of validating stuff we're trying to do. Talk a little bit into the mic so that we can catch this and send it out to the world. Ken Hirsch at uh, Cincinnati. It's, hey, thanks, good, Jeff. it's good to see a lot of this which is new to me and is and is inspiring. It is also good to see some of the stuff Richard was just talking about, which is validating, for example, we add work on the client portal um, to our uh, tech and Legal practice class this past semester. Well, Cincinnati's way ahead. They were working with Judith in, in that professors course, right? The dean there for years. Anybody else have this going on that we don't know about? Phil Boyd. <laughs> Phil, I think you're too old to come to these kind of things, you know. Haven't <laughs> yeah, right. you retired like ten years ago? <laughs> Twenty. <laughs> <laughs> But I still think about these issues, and uh, so I'll just direct my question to you, Ron. I mean, we all sit around wringing our hands and agreeing with the Granite assessment. How do we make it happen? I mean, what, what's going to change the law schools? My view is that economics are going to impact what uh, law deans and faculty <laughs> do, but uh, it, it's a tough, tough uh, path. Anything to have? Well, I, I mean, I have um, a, 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 an agenda. I have a, a hope, right? And one of them is that we can take the kind of course that sort of combines these skill sets and these deep looks at law and get every law school to teach them. And I, I think it has an educational impact and a justice impact. And I also think that it addresses Richard's point, because I think it teaches law practice management and the kinds of things that the incubators are beginning to bring uh, to the new law graduates as ways to help them get started. So we have an incubator here and um, Cook County has another one in there. There are about, about 10 or 12 of those happening, post-grad kind of approaches to this. Um, but I, I, I'm, not, I'm not thinking that we're hand wringers here, right? I'm not. And I think we're people out trying to do stuff. Um, the question is, is, is that you have this, this big bulk of, of 
faculty members who have been teaching the same way um, their Article 9 course, like the same way since like 1942, right? Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> yes, tell me your name. Jan Stone. Um, Hi, Jan. My, my question is you, your class that you teach is an upper level class, is that yeah. right? Is there anything you could do with this practically in a second semester, first year class? All right, so here's a so every all of us are doing these sort of curriculum committees to react to the the, the, to the crisis and so on. So, forth. so we had this all day curriculum committee, um, which was the whole faculty. Let's all get together. We went to a restaurant so we couldn't hear each other when we talked instead of in a classroom. Um, it worked out really well. Um, but, but, uh, so the whole faculty is thinking about this here, and I'm sure that's happening everywhere, right? Everybody's trying to say, what can we do to be better, to be more responsive, to, to compete with each other more effectively, and so on and so forth. And the question that after some of the uh, uh, drafts of our, our article was circulated uh, among many members of our faculty, that came from that committee to me was, can you do that course for everybody in the first year? Can you have everybody go through an opportunity to get some of the empathy that Sunrise is talking about and have some experience with other cultures to, to see um, these technologies to prepare, uh, you know, and all those, and um, I don't know, I think I can. We'll be doing it as a second year course, first semester, second year, and I don't really see a problem moving it up another semester. We have to coordinate with what's being taught in the first year, in the first semester, so that they have usable chunks of knowledge. But I don't think it would be a problem. Well, I mean, I'm sure you can do it at any point in the period. So there's two questions you're asking. One is, can you do it earlier? And the answer, sure. Um, second question is, is, can you scale it? You know, I teach 10 or 12 or 15 students, and I have a lot of help. I have two. Jessica and Andrew and I have another research assistant. I, you know, I mean, I, mean I, I can just sort of like push it down the hill and walk away and go play golf, you know, and it'll be just fine. But but um, so there's a lot of resources on those ten or ten or twelve people. Right? But I, I think we I mean, we've done here before teaching everybody how to do word processing and and you know eight hours in orientation. I, I think you can push this up earlier. You know, I mean, we can teach things more quickly and more efficiently. Yes, tell me your name. Um, I'm Doug Edmonds from the uh, University of North Carolina School of Law, and at the risk of embarrassing my friend and colleague Judith up there, um, a couple of years ago with the Director of Technical Services in our law, law library, I'm the Assistant Dean for IP at the law school, but I was surprised that we didn't have like an LPT course, and we floated it up, wrote a syllabus, wrote a uh, course proposal, because there's a real, been a real push, as in many curricula, to you know do more practical skills training courses, um, theory to practice sorts of courses, and we floated a course proposal that was approved by the Academic Affairs Committee, and then in the next breath they're like, but we're not going to let you teach it anytime soon. There's too many of these other practical skills courses that are frankly more important for the faculty, and we're being taught by tenured track faculty, and you know, neither Steve nor I are tenured track faculty. So I totally understood that. That's was, mean, isn't it? I was also disappointed um, because since then, that was I think in the fall of 2011, that, that the course got approved and there's been no mention from the Dean of Academic Affairs since then that we could maybe teach it at some point. So, um, I don't know, maybe Judith and I should talk to the Dean about that, but... Um, but it, there's a new LPD. Yeah, that's true, that's true. So, it, it, you know, we're making efforts, but I think, again, there's some there's some resistance or just for practical or logistical reasons, sometimes it's hard to get, get, get it going. I mean, I think there's a, if, if there's a time we can do this, it's now. No. I mean, you know, this, you take John's opening slide about Rahm Emanuel. I mean, this is the crisis time. We can't push our way into this arena with relevant, excellent education that addresses substance and, and procedure and heuristics and, and the need to deal with the, the core competencies that the Carnegie Commission identified. I mean, we, we can't do it now. We can never do it. Now is the time. Yeah. Say hello. I'm Sarah Francis from the School of Law in New York, hey. and um, our clinics use a case management system called the Mikas Attorney. Say it again? It's called the Mikas Attorney. Mikas, yes. Uh, the case management system. And my question is, do you think those types of programs actually are uh, useful in uh, evolving uh, the legal practice, or should they just automate curriculum behavior? <laughs> so Richard is our, our, our law practice management um, advocate and expert. 
Okay, so uh, programs like the biggest attorney really automate the back office functions of a, a law firm, like hunting, billing, calendaring, and things like that, which are not, those are pretty easy to learn in, in a way. What we're talking about are other kinds of software applications, which is legal work. Document automation, expert systems, ways of dealing with clients, uh, uh, getting uh, legal advice by SMS, legal advice systems, everything that we're talking about has an intersection between technology and law. And to create those things, they're rigorous, it's intellectually demanding, requires really analytical skills. Uh, back office applications will change, technology will change, and even the front office applications will change. My front office, I'm talking about Deborah Reed Sussman, it's the upper quadrant in his grid, which is where all the innovation takes place. It's the intersection of information technology and actual Law, digital legal services, and, and and that should be at the heart of law school. Well, I, I agree with everything you said. The only thing I'd add, I got you just a second. The only thing I'd add is that um, I think if your clinic is not using something like that, then there's a problem because how do you keep track of stuff, right? You have a bunch of individual practitioners who aren't, aren't really like sorting their, uh, managing their their practice as well. And managing your practice, even at that back office level, is an important set of skills. You gotta, especially if you're going into practice on your own, you got to have that stuff. So I wouldn't discount it anyway, but I think that it, you need that plus. You need more things. I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is, can those software vendors play a role in sure. taking the next step? Well, if they're smart enough to come and give you the stuff and, and, and help you teach it, um, there's one in the lobby software. right now. Yeah. 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 Clio is a good example. Clio is a web-based version of that kind of, uh, of tool um, that, that might go talk to them. Yeah, we'll talk to them. Uh, we make direct law there for free at law schools. You can just go right to the site. Students can sign on and they can experience a virtual law firm. We actually include in, in our thing a document automation solution. And you know, it, there's a lot of things you can get for free, right? Right, exactly. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm Michael Roback from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Um, we're starting, uh, or I'm proposing a clinic in the spring. It's really going to be a clinic for the clinics so that we can do things like have amicus, uh, train people to use amicus because not to disagree, but there are some things about amicus that can help the clinic if it's high turnover. Um, you can embed rules, uh, practice, uh, and management things that actually make training the students a little bit easier. But the students who learn how to build it are going to use other tools like Visio and things like that to help them understand data flow diagrams, how to do the legal engineering thing. So I think there's actually a place for all of that stuff. But for, for us, the other thing is, since we're so rich with solo and small practice in Kansas City, um, the idea of building a clinic that can be an outreach for law firms, and it could be a revenue source for the school. That's kind of what uh, we're trying to do. All right, so we're, we're at the end of our time. So we started out today with, here's the big idea of this law, justice, lawyering um, initiative. And instead of like jumping right to clinics in, tr in the traditional way, we sort of gave you a, a, some hybrid examples. So Judith is in the clinic, he's taught in the clinic, but isn't a core um, teaching experience as a clinic. I started in the clinic and my core thing isn't, so I'm not teaching a traditional clinic. Um, Sunrise is, is sort of teaching a little more traditional kind of clinic in Greg's environment. Um, and, and Richard's, uh, he's something completely different. So um, <laughs> next session, right? We have a group of people who, who grew up and developed expertise and are, are known as traditional clinical faculty members in, in law schools in the country. And we hope that we can get them to sort of galvanize an, an, an initiative that gets lots of folks like them to do this. The reason we started out with hybrids is that there are more people who aren't them. And so if you want to carry this message back, you don't have to be a clinical teacher to teach a course that has experiential and practice and field work aspects to it, um, you can do it right from the classroom. And so there's opportunity there too. So let's talk amongst ourselves with some coffee and do you have something else out there? Some donuts or something? I hope so. so okay, donuts. <laughs> <laughs>